having trouble hearing.
Oh, there we go. Do you know what? Now can everybody hear me? Jeez, everything I've been talking about, nobody can hear me. I know. Thanks for sticking around. I have no idea why you guys all stuck around but couldn't hear me. Now we can't. Oh, I'm so sorry. You missed all of the good stuff of the class. I've not nothing left. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right, you didn't miss much about this document, so I'll just say that. Uh, you missed some background, so I apologize. All right. Um, now where was I? Oh, the commission. Okay. So the the uh, compensation of the broker. So it, it may be in the future where you're negotiating the commission for yourself or your team uh, with your buyer. And I, I go back to what I said as far as having an agent in the Cleveland market that taught me something years ago. I used it a few times. It didn't really, it, it worked during a certain market, but in this market, it wouldn't necessarily work. Uh, he had come up with an agreement uh, with his broker that said he would get paid 3% of a commission, no matter what the compensation was, that the buyer that he's working with was willing to make up the difference between whatever was in the MLS and whatever compensation that he agreed to, which was the 3% in his uh, agreement. Buyers went for it in the Cleveland market. They agreed to it and he was very successful with it. I did it a few times here in the Canton market and I felt guilty because I basically would negotiate. What I would do is negotiate for the seller to pay the buyer's a little bit of the buyer's closing cost, which would include the difference between, so let's say I'm making $5,000, but I should really be making $7,000. So that $2,000 difference, I would write in the purchase agreement to get the list side. So the seller to pay $2,000 of the buyer's uh, closing cost. And then on the buyer's side of the agreement, it would show on the settlement statement that I was charging an additional $2,000 commission. So it really did. The seller paid $2,000 of the buyer's uh, closing cost, which then paid me. The problem was back then when I was doing that, there were sometimes legitimately where a buyer needed all $5,000 in closing costs or $3,000 in closing costs that they could get. Well, it seemed pretty self-serving and unfortunately not so good for the consumer that I was trying to negotiate the seller to pay more closing costs just so I could get paid more. And unfortunately, I did that for a while. And like I said, I, I felt pretty guilty about it at some point to where I was like, I can't do this. So I didn't do it. I have seen other agents do it. And whether you feel guilty about doing it or not, you're worth your value. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that the reason that I felt guilty for it is because if I went into a property and I offered $102,000 because we wanted the buyer uh, to pay me more commission and the seller was agreeing to that, great. But if we went in and the seller was like, no, I'm not paying this. Well, then I either have to waive it or my buyer can't afford to pay me, right? So what's going to happen? They're either going to find another agent to work with that doesn't charge that that difference and is just willing to accept what's in the MLS, or they're going to overpay for the property. And when we have an appraisal problem, perhaps, then I've got to eat it anyway, right? So it was just a struggle for me personally to justify how I could charge that. And the consumer then was on the hook for it because it was before we were ever having conversation about buyers broker and exclusive right agreements uh, we didn't we didn't use these so those were reasons why today would be a little bit different if i'm producing this document up front and the buyer is well aware of it that's great but unfortunately if you don't use these it's kind of hard to then say to the buyer hey by the way you're on the hook to pay me x right you can't do that go ahead Lynette. I wanted to jump back. so yeah so Help me understand though, I don't know if the problem is that you would use the same fee or like I say the brokerage fee, that's what it says to me. And I guess I honestly don't know that yeah. what that fee is for. Like it's not my fee. It's, right. It's the legacy. So I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, no, that's perfect. So Lynette asked for you, those of you on Zoom now that you can hear me. Um, Lynette asked a, a valid question, which was let's see if we have more chat, uh, which was basically explain to me. If we use the word administrative service fee and we have to explain what that fee goes towards, explain to me how we have the 225 additional commission fee and do we need to explain what that is and how do we go about that? So the reason that this was changed is because there was a class action lawsuit against Howard Hanna because Howard Hanna used the words administrative service fee as well as many other brokerages, by the way. Um, unfortunately, when the class action lawsuit was won uh, and Howard Hanna lost, they changed their terminology to say additional commission, 
Why? Because additional commission or commission is completely negotiable. A commission, there's there's the antitrust laws prevent you from saying that this is the commission for all brokerages. So when we say additional commission, you don't have to explain what the additional commission is for. It is simply additional commission. It's very arbitrary, I guess, to argue just because what are you going to argue? It's a commission. This is this is what I am. But for you as an agent, when the consumer says, why should I pay this additional commission? Sure. Do you need to have an answer? Absolutely. Well, if you're on the 70-30 plan, you're getting $75 of that money, which means it is additional commission, right? The other $150 comes to Legacy Group. And for any of you that are on the ALC, on the finance committee, or if you look at it, we're an open book company. I can tell you the difference between you getting a profit share check and us paying the bills is that $150 or the $225 for those of you that are on the 80-20 plan. If you look at our finances, we make on average about anywhere between twenty dollars and $35,000 a month in just those fees. If you look at what we profit share, that almost matches. And sometimes the profit share is much more over that amount. So for those companies that don't charge an additional commission fee, they're going to be struggling. For smaller brokerages or brokerages that just don't charge it at all, that is the difference between you actually being profitable and not. Um, our brokerage works, most brokerages, we have about a one to 3% margin. We're about one and a half to 2% margin on any given month. Sometimes it's 1%. Owning a brokerage is not for the faint of heart. It is not glamorous. It is very expensive. Uh, as real estate has gotten more competitive and plans have gotten more competitive, agents have become to where I want all of my commission and I, I don't care what services you offer. And so we've had to become as competitive as humanly possible. So when somebody asks you, Lynette, I would say, what does that money go for? That is the difference between our brokers being profitable and not. So what you're paying for in the additional commission is our brokerage here, whether you have a hub or not, whether you have a physical brick and mortar location is the difference between us being able to provide you services as the agent or not. So if you look at models that don't have a brick and mortar building, they still charge this fee because they have payroll services that they have to do for services that are for all of the agents, right? I mean, we're not going to be able to function very well if we don't have Amanda and Cassandra and Nicole, and we don't have these people and we don't have Mark. I mean, we need these people in order for you to be able to do business and grow the organization at the same time. So that is what that money is for. Now, for the teams that charge additional commission on top of the 225, you're going to have to answer what that's for. I can't answer that for you. You can say it's an additional commission, but if you're called out on why your fee is $4.99 and I can work with another Keller Williams agent for $2.25 or $2.95, why would I work with you? That's the value proposition that you have to come up with. Yeah. Okay. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so the $2.25 is built in there. If you'll notice, it's also on the consumer guide. Not all companies have it on the consumer guide. I put it on there because... It needs to be disclosed to somebody that they're paying that additional commission as soon as possible. And if you're not using a buyer's broker agreement, then unfortunately it needed to be somewhere. I am happy to remove that if we get to a point where we are all required to use a buyer agency agreement. Uh, there are 12 states, by the way, that have made a buyer agency agreement mandatory. So we, we probably won't be last with this, but we're also probably not gonna be next. Um, all right, and then basically this just says, as well, that the buyer, if they buy anything within the next 180 days after the agreement terminates, but if it was a property that we had shown them or something like that, that they still are going to owe us a commission. Again, have I ever or do I see in the future, near future, suing somebody that goes and does this? No, I don't. So I, I want to be an advocate for you and I want to be on your side. I'm not saying that this document doesn't mean something. It absolutely means something between you and the consumer. It's just not as enforceable as we would like it to be yet, right? But I've also not sued somebody for an exclusive right to sell that just says, uh, you brought a ready, willing, and able buyer and I just didn't show up to close it. We could, but we haven't, right? And so if we get to that point, which I can see somewhere in the next few years, uh, that might be a different story. But as of now, we don't. All right. Disclosure of buyer information. Uh, so this uh, number five just says that, you know, the buyer's agent uh, has permission to disclose to a seller your financial employment qualifications, right? Because we want to make sure that they can buy a house and you're giving that, you're giving that pre-approval letter 
uh, and any information without it being confidential to the listing agent. What's their down payment? That's on the purchase agreement. Who are they financing it with? How much are they financing, right? All of that information um, in order to get a loan. And you're giving a pre, uh, proof of funds letter, right? You have the permission to give that. I would always recommend, you know, redacting any private information that they don't want on there, like account number or mailing address, perhaps if they don't want it on there. But you need to make sure that they understand if you can pay cash for a property that there is a way to do that. As a listing agent, if you accept an offer without a proof of funds letter, that's very foolish because you've now entered into an, a binding agreement and you have nothing to back it up, right? Uh, and then the buyer's representation. So it just says on number six that the buyer uh, understands uh, the possibility of dual agency. Well, they also understand that when you give them the consumer guide because it goes over dual agency on that as well. And it explains what dual agency is. Um, I just, I want to remind you, I'll just take the minute to remind you that if you have any ownership interest in a property, you cannot represent a buyer or a seller as well. So if you're the buyer, you cannot represent a seller and be a dual agent on that purchase. If you are a listing agent of your own property, one that you have, even if you have a dollar financial interest in that property, you cannot represent the buyer that's coming. Now there is a way to do it. You just won't have, they won't have representation. And that's the last section of the agency disclosure that says that the buyer is unrepresented. But the buyer needs to understand that they're unrepresented, right? Um, so there are ways to do it that you're not a dual agent. And some brokerages don't even allow dual agency. So you'll see this in our agreement, but some brokerages say there's no dual agency whatsoever. And I will say that we had discussions about that a little bit at the um, convention we just got back from, from Cincinnati for Ohio Realtors as well. <clears throat> the previous president, John Mangus, last year out of the Toledo area actually had a president advisory group put together to find out how many brokerages actually use dual agency and if we should even be practicing it in Ohio. They haven't outlawed it. Nothing came from that other than to say there are brokerages that offer it and we don't see a problem with it yet. But because of this buyers, these lawsuits, who knows, that could come out that we couldn't be a dual agent. So well, there's more to come on that, I'm sure. Uh, and then the, uh, we did the buyer representation, number six. And number seven, it does say it's a binding agreement and that they should seek legal counsel before signing it. Even though it says that, again, I just keep saying, I've never sued anybody yet. I don't know that we will. So please understand that this, this agreement is really to get your buyer in the mindset of, oh, I am exclusively working with X as my agent. I'm going to honor that relationship because I signed a legally binding agreement and I don't want to be sued. They don't need to know that we haven't sued over it or that we won't try and enforce it, right? All right. And then appointment of other agents, if you're on a team, uh, you might appoint another agent. You might appoint another agent when you go on vacation, right? So it just says that the buyer has an absolute right to veto any person that's not acceptable. So you can't just assign them somebody that they don't like or don't want to represent them in the transaction. So if you are going on vacation, you might want to introduce your person to whoever, um, whoever that agent is to your buyer or seller uh, and make sure that they get along, make sure they're comfortable with that. Uh, and I would also say that if you're in the middle of a transaction, you already have a transaction going, make sure that you're on a vacation that you have um, added that agent to your agency disclosure form and had all parties sign it. Because when you're now giving your file to another agent for them to work it and private information of the consumer, they need to be on the agency disclosure form too. It still won't impact who you put in the MLS for your for who's getting the uh, the credit. That won't matter. You can still just be you. Okay. And then, so to go back to Carlin, you would ask about what happens if there's a problem. So it basically says for the arbitration that if, you know, if, if there is a dispute, which they do happen, um, that we would end up having an arbitration. The arbitration would be held in Stark County because that's where our brokerage is. Uh, we would probably end up paying for it, but it does say all the costs or fees of the arbitration shall be equally divided. Good luck trying to get a buyer to pay for arbitration. Good luck trying to get a buyer to arbitration, period. Uh, you know, typically what happens is if we get a call that says, I want out of this exclusive buyer's agency agreement, uh, I'm going to have a conversation with you and I'm going to ask you what happened. Do you want to let them out of it? What do we want to do? Do I want to call the other brokerage and say, hey, we want a 25% referral? What do we want to do? Um, then we'll try and come to a resolution. And if we can't, we'll end up just letting them out of the deal. Because again, as much as you might be upset about losing 
a $10,000 commission or whatever, it is not worth us suing somebody to try and get that money because it will affect your future sales for the rest of your career and the brokerages, right? So, and then we have the fair housing statement in here uh, that basically just says the same thing that it says in every agreement that we have. It's pre-type language from the Division of Real Estate and Ohio Revised Code that has to be in everything. We ask the buyers to sign this. You should always give a buyer a copy of what they signed, um, whether it's the consumer guide, whether it's the agency, whatever it is, listing agreement, and then you should sign it too. I will tell you it's been argued that if you don't sign it, it's not valid. Uh, that has not been tried in court, but I can say that speaking to some other attorneys that opposed us um, when that came true, they said, well, go ahead and take us to court. Your agent never signed that agreement, so it's not valid. Don't know that that would be the case if we took it to court or not, but nonetheless, it would be fully executed if you both sign it. And so if you don't sign it, it's very hard to enforce something, right? Because you are also responsible for certain key points in this. Okay. So are there any questions about the buyer's agency agreement, how it should be used, when you should be using it, or why you should be using it? Okay. I, I didn't I didn't think that there would be anybody on Zoom um, since you couldn't hear for half of it. Um, any questions about why we're using it, how we're using it? Nobody say anything. All right. I will say again, we will not make this mandatory now, but I'm going to guess that by the first quarter of next year, pending what happens with these lawsuits, this form will change quite a bit. And I just want to make sure that you are all aware of what's going on. I'm going to be holding a class for all three of the brokerages. So Keller Williams Elevate, Legacy, and Living on October 25th. It's going to be a legal update. It's going to be here in person and in Zoom on Zoom. I would encourage you to attend. In fact, we might even have it broadcast. I might even invite other brokerages, right? Because nobody's really talking about what's going on with these lawsuits. And nobody that I'm aware of has walked into a listing appointment that said, uh, I'm not willing to pay for the buyer's broker's compensation, but it will come with all of these articles now coming out. You're going to start getting questions. So again, takeaways from this, prepare yourself, get a document that says what your value proposition is, start getting exclusive buyer agency agreements signed um, and talking about it with other agents because it's a big deal. Okay. If there's nothing else, I will not keep you for an entire hour. We only have 15 minutes left. There's no way in 15 minutes I'm going to go over the other buyer's agency agreement. So, all right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that. Yeah, the division is. Or I'm sorry, the 